gonna have to play this music before we because I have to say our founder made pitch challenge has been is actually one of my favorite parts we actually started the business doing it our it, our first pitch challenge was the future of wellness pitch challenge and today I'd love to just bring on um, our incredible judges which is which you know Kat, I, I'd love to yes great everybody's on um, Jennifer Palmer um, great Greg so let's just I, uh, the way that this will work is we have three we had hundreds of um, pitch applicants um, that, that applied all in beauty, food, wellness. I mean, we went through a, a ton of different, different applications and we came out with three incredible finalists. Um, but right now I'd love to just go through and just kind of talk, talk to, to each of the judges and just tell us how you're working with brands. Kath, I'd love to start with you on how you're working with brands and kind of what you're seeing in the market um, you know, and, and what you're looking for um, during this pitch challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Great, great to meet everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Kath. I'm an investment associate at Clearco. Clearco is the largest e-commerce investor in the world, and we provide non-dilutive capital to e-commerce businesses to really support their growth initiatives so that they can scale their business to the next level. Um, so yeah, we're democratizing the financial space. It's, it's non-dilutive funding and really removing the barriers so that businesses can succeed. Um, so yeah, we've so far invested over 2 billion to over 5,000 companies globally and recently went through our Series C funding. Um, so yeah, really excited to be here and um, see, see what the founders have to offer. Wonderful. Um, Katie, I'd love to just hear about your work at Pilot, you know, what for people that don't know what Pilot is, you know, just give them some context around there and then also how you're working with brands to build the future of, you know, consumer and, and, and business. Absolutely. Thanks, Megan. Uh, great to great to see everyone here on the panel. Um, I'm Katie Myrick. I lead vertical expansion at Pilot. And we at Pilot provide a full stack of uh, financial back office solutions to brands. So everything from bookkeeping, taxes, CFO and controller services, um, really a lot of the kind of financial foundations that take quite a bit of time to scale your way into before you have an in-house team, um, as I think the previous session uh, spent quite a bit of time talking about as well. Um, and we work with uh, hundreds of the you know, most up and coming like consumer goods and retail companies, um, all of the kind of growth oriented brands you find on Instagram that you're hoping to kind of grow into yourself. Um, definitely really excited to, to hear from the folks pitching today and, um, and hear what you guys have to offer. Awesome. Um, and Jennifer, I'd love to hear. Hi, thanks for having me. My name is Jen Palmer and I'm CEO of Gerber Finance, an e-capital company. Gerber Finance is the leading finance partner for companies experiencing accelerated growth, looking to achieve sustainable profit. We're a female-led company providing personalized financing to fast-growing CPG companies looking for capital, but also looking to minimize dilution. So companies who are looking to grow and need that support for growth, but don't want to dilute their equity. We've worked with some powerhouse companies like Hula, Stasher, Puracy. And while we focus on CPG, we also work with companies across various industries with a focus on women owners, women-led companies, and the natural product industry. We're also more than just a capital provider. We have a social purpose too. In addition to Gerber Finance, we have the Gerber Finance Foundation, which is focused on providing relief from food insecurity for children. And because giving back is so important to us, we usually align ourselves with storing CPG companies who are also doing good for the community and or the environment. I love it. And everybody, it's it's just great because you hear Pilot, you hear Gerber Finance, you hear 301 Inc. So so in the industry, if you if you talk to brands, everyone is huge, huge fans because you guys are really building incredible reputations across across all the verticals. So Greg, just just last but not least, 301 Inc. General Mills 301 Inc. You're the fund manager. So Tell us, tell us a little bit about what 301 Inc. does for those, those of you that don't know. Yeah, hi, Megan, and thank you. I'm uh, thrilled to be here on behalf of 301 Inc. I'm the fund manager, like you said. 301 Inc. is the venture capital arm of General Mills. We look to make minority investments in brands and really bring them our support capabilities and the power of General Mills to help them scale as they're looking to go from those early stage to, to fully scaled and, and in a broad, broad um, distribution. Um, some of the brands we currently have in our portfolio are Kite Hill, Plant Based Yogurt, Purely Elizabeth Granola, and Good Culture Cottage Cheese, among, among a number of others. 
Um, you know, when we're going out and looking at products, we're looking for, you know, a remarkable product offering, a strong founder and kind of origin story that they can bring to the table, and then obviously a viable business model. So those are kind of the three pillars that we look to assess as we're looking at, at brands and companies. Wonderful. And, and before I, you know, I announce the or announce our first finalist, I just want to go through some of the things that the winner of this pitch challenge will win. They'll win a golden ticket for a stop stop um, for a spot on the next season of Entrepreneur Elevator Pitch. They'll have a dedicated feature on entrepreneur.com, 30 minute call one on one with Michelle Romano, who is like a huge star. She was on Dragon's Den and she's the founder of ClearCo. Um, you know, a 20% off of, of um, the core, core pilot core for six months, uh, one hour of executive office hours with pilot and, and with, the, with the founder of pilot, which is Wasim Tahar, um, and then a one-on-one -on -one consult consult consultation with Gerber executives and a $5,000 $5, discount off any capital advance from Gerber Finance. Um, and then a podcast and the invitation on Gerber's Gerber Finance's podcast, which is We Grow Together. So there's a ton, ton. I'm like literally only giving like a, a little bit of, of what the winner the winner will get, but there's just a, a ton of you know business building that will be happening for the winner. Um, and with that, we're gonna start with Amy. All right, let me just share my screen. I love how we're all so well versed on Zoom now <laughs> after a year of this. Um, hi everyone, thanks so much for having me today. My name is Amy Zavrania and I'm the CEO and founder of UVA, an at-home diagnostics company. I was really excited to be a mom and as a woman with irregular cycles my whole life and a PhD in biomedical sciences, I knew it was going to be difficult but doable. However, I never expected the journey to be as heartbreaking and devastating as it was. My husband and I wanted to avoid going through invasive treatments because we knew we couldn't handle the loss of a failed cycle. That being said, I did everything I was supposed to do. I used ovulation sticks. I took my body temperature every morning and tracked everything. I ate well, worked out, and I followed the how to get pregnant rule book perfectly. And yet I still got preg negative pregnancy tests month after month. The apps I was using never seemed to understand me. I came to realize that all of these so-called smart tools were designed for women who had perfect cycles and that wasn't me. I didn't fit that mold. I began to learn that having irregular periods affected a majority of the female population. This made me realize that women didn't have the tools they needed to understand their cycle, but the technology existed. It just wasn't being applied to women's health. After 18 devastating months, I conceived my beautiful baby boy and realizing that one in eight couples experience fertility struggles, I took what I learned from my journey and founded UVA. Before I dive into our company, let me give you a quick overview of the landscape. Couples experiencing difficulty conceiving are limited to two options. The first are inexpensive and inaccurate solutions that can be used at home. In a survey we conducted of over 600 women, 73% of women did not conceive even after using these products for an average of six months. None of these solutions are meant for women with irregular cycles and that accounts for two thirds of the female population. This leaves the majority of women left with option two, which are expensive and invasive procedures. As women are trying to conceive later in life, they find themselves leaning to these options more and more. The problem is at this point, every single day matters. Women underwent treatments for an average of eight months before moving on. And the cost is massive. A majority of women spent more than $10,000 while the remaining spent more than 20,000. The bottom line is we deserve better and UVA is making that happen. We have created a tool that provides clinical level accuracy in the privacy of a woman's bathroom. The, our solution is affordable, convenient, and non-invasive. A woman simply orders an UVA kit. She will receive a handle, holder, and one cycle's worth of disposable test strips. Each day, she will provide a urine sample on an UVA test. She then scans that strip using the camera directly on her phone and receives her results in the app within seconds. The app will report her hormone results and a customized daily action plan. She will be informed of her most fertile days and confirmation of whether she ovulated. If a woman is working with a clinician, her clinician will receive the daily results in their HIPAA compliant UVA dashboard. This enables everyone to be part of a more comprehensive conversation. UVA is an experience that starts with data and ends with a woman being empowered with information about her fertility. We're truly set apart from the competition in the fertility space. No other product provides accurate actual hormone concentration, accommodates women with irregular cycles, confirms ovulation, 
and shares that data with, with healthcare providers in real time. And we're being recognized for all of our efforts because we won the 2021 CES Innovation Award. UVA has a unique go-to-market strategy that is coveted and untouchable by our competitors. Last year, many fertility doctors' offices were closed due to the pandemic as fertility care was classified as an elective treatment. This was a devastating reality for the women who were working to get pregnant. As doctors were unable to see patients, physicians requested that UVA release the product in order for them to reach their patients during that time. This opened up a whole new sales channel for us. We, we currently have 179 clinics in our pipeline and are about to engage with a healthcare system that will be adopting UVA's platform across its 18 hospitals. We feel confident in our model because we have almost a 75% conversion rate. To date, 72 clinics from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York to OC Fertility in California are integrating UVA into their practice. Clinicians are finding UVA's platform and especially the data to be incredibly helpful. It's creating a symbiotic relationship between the patient and clinician where women get to take control of their own health and our data is directly informing medical care. All the while, we have a direct-to-consumer stream running in the background. We are now able to go to the direct-to-consumer market with clinical validity and buy-in in place, making us stand out in the current market. We have also set up a subscription model that results in a recurring revenue with a 65% retention rate month after month. Regardless of whether the customer comes to us through a clinician or directly, they pay for the UVA kit. And each of our packages includes access to the smartphone app and if applicable, integration with the clinician dashboard. While we're currently focusing on fertility, we have built a technology that is scalable to additional areas of health. Our next product is moving directly into menopause and we will be growing into other healthcare spaces shortly after that. Our model to monitor, learn and intervene is easy for us to repurpose in other areas incredibly quickly. We have patented the full process of obtaining quantitative hormone measurements from urine in the privacy of a woman's home using solely an UVA test strip and a smartphone app. The patent also covers our one-of-a-kind machine learning algorithm to learn each woman's unique personal fertility profile. We don't compare a woman's hormone levels to that standard threshold or the perfect woman that we all know doesn't exist. The algorithm learns each woman's baseline hormone levels and then detects fluctuations by comparing to that. The entire experience is completely personalized. So we are able to tell a woman exactly what is happening with her fertility using her own data. Finally, we're curating an invaluable data set that has never before been available. UVA is truly innovating in the space between personalized at-home diagnostics and telemedicine. My team and I started UVA because we lived through the agony of being unable to conceive that easily. We are truly a diverse team with expertise in data science, computer vision, and clinical research. We approach our solution focusing on building innovative technology and ensuring the product works to provide value to, to our customers. And our hard work is paying off. We're celebrating our first Uva baby who was born just last month at seven pounds and two ounces. And I hope you will join me in changing the future of fertility and health by making the journey less complicated and affordable. And on that note, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Amazing, Amy, thank you so much. I, we love the mission. Um, who wants to start with questions, Jennifer? Yeah, I would love to. As a proud mom of four girls, this product certainly touches my heart. So congratulations, Amy, on your son and your amazing creation and company. I think it's Thank I think you. it's just really great. I was going to ask you about the effective rate, how many women using your device get pregnant within six months of using it. You just said that this month you're, or last month you're celebrating your first Uva baby. Are, are there other women currently pregnant as a result? Yeah, that's like the best email I get in the morning or like we just had someone say I want to cancel my subscription because I got a positive pregnancy test. It's honestly the best email that we can get. Um, we just launched the product. We have to keep that in mind. We launched it in September. Um, so we have over 40 pregnancies that we know of. And I say that we know of because we don't actively ask women if we've worked for them. Living it myself, I'm so sensitive to the emotions and the triggers that that question can ask. So we're trying to get really creative on how to get that positive feedback that we have helped you conceive. Um, okay. The way that we're doing this through the data and the clinicians telling us or the patient telling us themselves. Okay, great, thank you. I have like 20 questions, but I'm gonna just <laughs> ask two more if that's okay. Uh, looking ahead, who will you be marketing to? Will you be marketing towards clinics, doctors, or to the end user? It's, or well, so we've kind of, we have a whole sales stream with the clinician piece because that's where we started with last year. We launched earlier than we were expecting to. We were planning on launching in 2021. Um, with that being said, because we've done, the direct-to-consumer has kind of been running on autopilot, 
It's all been organic growth. We haven't spent money on marketing yet. We are now getting ready to really put some fuel on that fire and let D2C go, go at it. Um, so we are starting to target um, the direct-to-consumer market now. Okay, great. And my last question, although I have many more, uh, who owns the information? And if it's you, what will you be doing with that information collected? Yes, yeah, so Uva currently owns the information, but now I will be honest about how we're going to handle this. There's a lot of utility for this data, but we've never set out to like solely monetize on the data component of it. So if we ever decide to roll this out and make it available to the uh, pharma like, uh, pharmaceuticals or industry in any way, we're going to involve our users in that that revenue stream as well. So first they have to sign off on it. And two, if we're making money on it, you deserve to make money off of it too, because it's your information. So that's kind of built into our foundation to begin with. Great, thank you, good luck. Thank you. We have a couple more minutes, Katie, Greg, uh, Kath. Um, I have a question. Oh, oh go ahead, Kath. Okay, um, I was just going to ask, so in terms of, um, I absolutely lo love the idea of the brand, it's so innovative, and, and congratulations on the award as well that you recently won. Um, I just wanted to ask, so now that you've launched the, the D2C side of the website, is the plan to have that as like the main revenue stream, or are you still looking to have more like the, the doctors and then the wholesale side of the business be like the, the main thing, or, or what does that split look like? Oh. What I believe that COVID has kind of shown light on is that there's the consumer now expects clinical accuracy and that level of data in their home. They don't want to go to the lab for routine blood work or routine workups anymore. So we're really at that cutting, we're right at the forefront of that model. We are able to provide that level of accuracy in a consumer's home. But what that puts us in a unique position of is, are you a direct to consumer company or a B2B to C company? And I, I know investors hate things in the gray, but unfortunately, UVA is in the gray. We are really owning both of those strategies because we're getting interest from large hospital networks. Like we're, We are in partnership with a huge hospital network right now, where we are going to be enrolling a program for any woman that comes in, thinks she wants to get pregnant. She gets enrolled in the UVA program and has to use UVA for X number of months. However, there's it's a disservice to the community if we don't also have a direct-to-consumer stream, where if you're not ready to go to a doctor yet, you still want to add value to your journey. So we really do live in the gray. We're going to go 50-50 in both directions, to be honest. Um, but the way that UVA sits right now, 60% of our revenue is coming from the clinician side, 40% direct to consumer. I'll also leave it at, we haven't really put fuel on the D2C side yet. So that's about to kick off. Wonderful. We have one uh, time for just one last question. Hey. Oh, Katie, where are you going to go? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, Amy, thank you so much. Um, I'm currently pregnant with number two. So this is very, oh, very timely and very close to my heart as well. Kind of like what Jennifer was mentioning. Um, my biggest question, you know, on the marketing front, I think you guys have a really clear opportunity here to build community. Um, I think that this is a very challenging topic that women don't have a lot of forums for engagement on. So curious if you have any specific initiatives on that particular marketing channel and, and how you're thinking about approaching that. It is obviously incredibly sensitive, uh, triggering, private, um, but also I think ripe for, for disruption. So curious what your thoughts Absolutely. are on that. Yeah, that's very much aligned with where we're at too. Um, we want to build a trusted community where you can ask whatever questions you want. If, even if you want to just share your Uva data with someone and get feedback, like we want to be able to provide that resource for you. So we do have an internal UVA user community that is only um, available to our UVA customers as well as our clinical partners. So they're able to get access to our clinicians very easily as well as through that forum. Um, on the other side, we do have a really like active community on social media where we're putting out um, educational content more so than the scare tactics and all this like fluff that a lot of our competitors are doing. In my mind, it's not about convincing a woman that she has to use UVA. Instead, it's about educating her on all the aspects that UVA does, like kind of fill. And then women are smart enough to figure out like, okay, this is why I need UVA. I don't need to spoon feed it to them. So that's been working really well for us because we're going at it from a very genuine and authentic, we're taking a very authentic approach. Wonderful. So super authentic, Amy. Thank you so much for particip participating. Also, uh, Angie from um, Angie Tran just commented um, from our audience. Is it available in Canada? Not yet. We're working on it, hopefully by the end of the year, because it's the, the approval process across all the different countries has been so difficult through COVID. There's been a lot of delays. So we hope by the end of the year, we'll be available in Canada, but we're working on it. 
I can imagine. Well, thanks so much. Um, our next finalist that's presenting, Kaylee Donwald, um, and she's the founder and CEO of Sacred Serve. So Kaylee, you are on to present to our panel of judges. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Let me get my screen share going. Can you guys see that okay? Perfect. Well, I'm Kaylee Donawald, the founder of Sacred Serve, and we make a plant-based line of gelato designed to bring function into frozen indulgence. And what that really means is each one of our ingredients is really chosen first and foremost for its health promoting properties. So what we bring to market is this premium level indulgence alongside really powerful plant-based nutrition. Now, the reason for that is growing up, I suffered really severe cases of both asthma and allergies as well as a host of other things. And every doctor and specialist told me this is just the way I was born and I would need to rely on medicine for the rest of my life. But then when I was 25 years old, I took a sabbatical and went to live in Bali, Indonesia, where I embarked on a two week raw food cleanse. So really just eating fresh fruits and vegetables for two weeks. And within that amount of time, my body completely healed itself of all of these conditions without any medication. And so what I realized in that moment was not only was I not born with these conditions like every doctor had told me, but it was actually the food I had been eating my whole life that was making me and keeping me so sick. And that food is really just the standard American diet. So I went back to school for nutrition and decided to really target the root cause of what my issue was, which is simply the food being offered to consumers and prove that we can do things in a much more nutrient dense way. So I took a look at the most dairy sugar laden category that there is and decided to revolutionize that set. And so of course that is ice cream. And when looking at the labels in the better for you dairy ice cream set, um, this is a perfect example. And of course, after going through nutrition school, I can tell you that just about every single ingredient in here is very harmful for our health and, and rather inflammatory, which leads to all those conditions I was suffering from. I was thinking maybe the non-dairy set looks a little bit better than this. And unfortunately, it's all very similar. A lot of these gums and stabilizers and refined ingredients, um, all really poor for our health. So what I did was I came out with a plant-based line of cold crafted gelato that's made from young coconut meat and then flavored with just different superfoods, adaptogenic herbs, and even medicinal mushrooms, and then sweetened everything with a low glycemic unrefined coconut sugar. So here's a quick snapshot of some of the ingredients that we're working with. This young coconut meat is packed with all of these MCTs, which are the healthier fats for you. Um, in the market, that's up 250% year over year. Same with some of our other key ingredients like matcha and maca, all really super food powerful ingredients. So what we're doing in the marketplace is really bringing an offering that hits all consumer desires at once. So it's completely allergen friendly, free of the top eight. It's low glycemic, making it paleo and diabetic friendly. And then of course it's clean label, plant-based and has all of those added functional ingredients in there as well as an amazing taste. So here's some of the innovations that we're working on. We have this proprietary cold crafting process. What I learned going through nutrition school is that most of the items we get that come in a box from a food perspective um, are really lacking the critical micronutrients that are the building blocks to health. And so these are destroyed by heat in the manufacturing process. And so what we do is we process everything at lower temps to make sure that those, all those really good plant-based nutrients we're working with are available to the end consumer. We also have a really upgraded texture. I think that's one of the biggest questions people have when they think of non-dairy ice cream is that icy texture. And so the way you get a creamy texture is dairy-based proteins, a lot of fat and a lot of sugar and gums and stabilizers. And we have none of that, but the reason our texture is so good is because we're using young coconut meat as opposed to coconut milk. And so for people that aren't familiar, that comes from the same green coconuts that give you coconut water. But if you scrape the inside of those shells, there's this little coconut pulp in there. And so that's the base. It got all this fiber in there, which gives us that great texture. And then of course we have functional ingredients, a really unique sustainable packaging that I'll talk about shortly. And then all of our nutritionals are really great as well. So the opportunity for us right now is huge. The US frozen dessert market alone is $27.7 billion. According to SPINS, consumers are starting to navigate beyond just the dairy-based set and looking for plant-based, low glycemic and nutrient dense options. Right now, our plant-based category is up 26.5% year over year, so it's growing like crazy. If we compare that to the dairy-based ice cream set, that's only growing at 1%. So very clear to see how we're about to take a ton of market share from that set moving forward. 
what we're doing in market and why we're going to win. Here's us compared to just the top four players in the category right now. So we've got this clean label, no gums or stabilizers, and then of course have these upgraded added functional ingredients. Um, everyone likes to talk about Halo Top. They became very famous for their low calorie pints. We like to point out that even on every metric here, we're lower than them as well, uh, just with the exception of sugar, because again, we're not using any artificial sweeteners or sugar alcohols, as those can be really uh, disruptive to the gut. Uh, some of our traction in the market, we always like to call out that we had an MBA player find our product and fall in love. I think it's just a really good example of who knows their body and nutrition better than a professional athlete. So he's now an investor of ours and really supportive. Um, and then we had a really prominent chef in Chicago, Chef Bill Kim, who was quoted saying that our product is really the moment of now. It's, it's what's happening and it's what's going to be happening. Um, just again, from a nutrition standpoint and really moving that into a more indulgent category. From a sales perspective, this is a quick shot, snapshot of our distribution right now. We started here in the Midwest, we're slowly trickling down, um, but we've been very strategic with our growth, focused really on natural and specialty channels and doing a regional play. Um, so we can really build the brand awareness as we go. Um, we were actually just fortunate enough to win the supplier of the year award for Whole Foods for the entire Midwest region. So that's a huge honor. They only select one brand across all categories and really speaks to the uniqueness of our innovation and the strength of our team. Um, here's our team in-house. Uh, we've got John as our COO, myself acting as CEO. We have Erica, who's our VP of sales coming from Malk Organics. And then Jose runs all of our logistics. I think as an earlier panel was talking about being an emerging brand, we do also have a lot of our team outsourced. So we have CFO and bookkeeping, sales management, marketing, and PR, um, all outsourced, great teams. Um, this is my first rodeo. It's my first company. So I knew how important it was to really build a stellar team of advisors. Most of them are investors as well. But you can see that we have people from everything from Enjoy Life Foods, Catalina Crunch, Jimmy Bar, True Sweets, Milk Organics, and Farmer's Fridge. So a lot of founders and experienced people really helping us out on a weekly basis. Um, so this is the most exciting thing that we've launched in 2021. When I first started the company was when I first realized that ice cream pints are not recyclable. Most people think they look like paper, so why can't you? But there's actually a plastic lining on the inside as, that acts as a moisture barrier that renders them trash. And so thinking about trying to do something good for our bodies and the environment, I had a very difficult time launching a plastic-based uh, packaging. But we are excited to share that we finally cracked the code. We've just launched a 100% plastic-free version that is fully recyclable, compostable, and biodegradable right at home. Um, so we're super thrilled to finally be offering that and really push the whole frozen category uh, forward with that. So here's just a quick snapshot of some of the press hits that we've gotten. I think we're really just excited to be a part of this huge plant-based movement that's happening, the functional movement. I think a lot of publications are really picking up on that and consumers are excited. Um, so we're really looking forward to seeing where this is going. Thank you. Haley, you have thought of everything and anything and it's so refreshed. I'm, I just, I've always wanted an ice cream that I could feel good about eating and feel good about the planet. I had no idea that that the I, you taught me something that the the pints are not recyclable. I mean that's yeah. huge. So right. anyway, I will. I, I know we have five minutes for Q and A. So uh, who wants to start? I can jump in here. Hey, Kaylee, nice job. That was a that was a great pitch, and I, I love the product. It looks delicious. Um, I was curious when you get to a label that clean. Oftentimes, one of the big concerns is shelf life and product quality issues. I was curious. The shelf life relative to the competitive set and if you've experienced any you know mold or water activity issues or anything like that with the label that yeah great question you know i think we're really fortunate at this point to be a frozen product because we can really extend our shelf life in that way and, and we're, we're realizing that we can bring a lot of nutrient density into the category specifically because of that um so yeah we have a two-year shelf life from the time of manufacturing so we are pretty set off from that standpoint and haven't seen any real issues there great I can jump in. Um, first of all, love the brand. I'm a vegan myself and can really relate to, to some of the struggles that you find, especially when trying to find an ice cream that tastes good and is good for the planet. And it's amazing to see that, that you launched the 100% plastic free. Um, I just wanted to hear more around like, the, the customer acquisition strategy because, you know, so many brands out there are now going down like the vegan route and the, the healthy route. Um, so, yeah, just wanted to, to hear more on sort of what your strategy looks like to, to get new customers. 
Yeah, we're really um, looking towards building a community. And so like you say, there's a lot of new entrants. It's very competitive, especially our ice cream set right now. And so we're differentiating both on the ingredients, but also our story. And so we're really creating a strong brand and focusing on um, both my healing journey as well as sharing the healing journeys of other people and really elevating them. Um, and so I think, yeah, building a community and really having the strength behind the brand is gonna be our best bet for moving forward. Great product. I cannot wait to try it. I too am a vegan, so super excited about this. I was actually just wondering if maybe you can talk a little bit more about your sales breakdown across the various categories. Yeah, so right now the bulk of our sales is coming through um, wholesale distribution. So we do have an e-commerce presence, but that's only about five to 10% of our business being a frozen product. Those logistics are pretty challenging. Um, so yeah, the bulk is through mass retail, again, natural specialty channels specifically. We do have a food service that was slightly put on pause during the pandemic. Um, but before the pandemic, we were in you know a bunch of juice bars and hotels, um, places like that, which I expect to pick up this year and next. And are you working with a co-man? We are in the process right now of transitioning. So we've had manufacturing in-house for the last three years. Part of the reason for that is just getting our volumes up. But the second piece was I learned rather quickly that how we make our product is traditionally very different than how gelato has been made. So we've had to become experts with manufacturing our own product to then take our equipment and train a co-packer on how to do that. Also helps avoid some packet issues, which I could cheat you a note about later if it adds some yeah. We have five more minutes of Q and A, so feel free to. Yeah, uh, Kaylee, uh, great job! I too can't wait to to try the the product. Um, I think a, you know, Kath and Jen's questions both kind of touched on this, but would love to hear more about kind of how, like, more specifics on that storytelling aspect. I do think your your differentiation is is pretty nuanced. And so having enough real estate to really tell that story, um, plus obviously given your personal connection to and your your journey. I'm just curious, like what, uh, what platforms are you seeing work best for you? Like, and which of all these different, um, different value propositions resonating most with with your consumer? Yeah, right now, I would say the bulk of our communication directly with consumers comes through Instagram, and we've seen a lot of engagement there. So I think that that's been good for us from a storytelling perspective. Um, and so I would say that the pieces of our story, or at least the attributes of our product that we see consumers really latching onto these days is one, the healing journey through food. I think any anecdotal story around that is really powerful. I think it's one thing for people to read, oh, this ingredient helps me, but it's another thing to hear, oh, this person changed their diet and they fixed all of these things in a matter of two weeks. Um, and then I think the functional ingredients is something we're really seeing consumer interest around these days, um, most notably adaptogens. I think that that's a buzzword, but it's a very powerful ingredient. Um, so I'm excited because adaptogens really to be effective need to be consumed all the time. And so if we're seeing it in all these different types of foods, I think that that's a really you know, good way to go about it. Um, so we're seeing yeah, a lot of consumer interest around that. Given, given the high quality of your ingredients, are you able to successfully compete with you know, competitors? They're not really competitors, but others in the same category um, from a margin perspective. Yeah, we have incredibly strong margins right now. So actually coming out of the gates, I had priced our product at $8.99 on shelf. And that was because our young coconut meat is extremely expensive. Um, and so what I ended up doing was I actually swapped equity with one of our suppliers to get their rock bottom pricing, which allowed us to get essentially container load pricing um, early on so that we could both lower our pricing to $6.99 and retain really strong margins. Great idea. And we can open you talk to any like supply chain concerns as you scale. Um, I don't know much about the the sort of um, the procurement set or the value chain for young coconut meat. So just curious, like uh, if you are able to really hit that inflection point of growth, um, one of the classic challenges is having to make trade offs on quality of ingredients. So so curious how you think about planning for the long term there. Yeah, so young coconut meat is a rather untapped ingredient here in the US right now, although it's very much on the incline. Um, so if you think about all the coconut water on the market, this is kind of a byproduct of that. So there's certainly a lot of room for us to go. Um, but we what we do is we harvest it in Thailand and ship it over frozen and it's a raw product. So the quality, you know, I think any 
type of sacrifice we might make is just where it's sourced. Right now we're sourcing from a very specific region in Thailand that we have found to have the sweetest variety of young coconut. But there's certainly a lot of other areas we could go, Philippines, Mexico, um, they just don't have the sweetest taste. So I think we'd be looking at maybe swapping in one of those and then adding a little additional coconut sugar, which again, it's all kind of the same thing, but I think that would probably be um, you know, a compromise that we may make at scale, but also we're very innovative and we're looking at, you know, base recipes beyond just the young coconut meat. That's what we're working with now, but our focus really is around nutrient density. So I think that there's a lot of other things besides just coconut milk and some of the milks we've seen on the market uh, that we're excited to explore. I love it. And if we have any questions from the audience, feel free to ch chime in, but I mean, Kaylee, this has been so wonderful. I mean, really, really fascinating um, the way that you've even thought about building your business, your board, you know, the, your supply chain, giving equity. I mean, people don't think about this as their first business. So super, super strategic. Um, you probably need like 10 plus plus years and uh, going to Expo West and talking to people to, to get there. So very, very impressive for your first business. Um, and, and with that, um, we'll open, um, we are going to invite Tolu. Um, Tolu, who is the founder of Sapien Beverage. Hi, my name is Tolu Obikunle. I am um, the founder of Sapien's Beverage. And after graduating from Columbia in 2017, I went into finance as a career. And something I learned pretty quickly is that a lot of the relationship building and um, informal networking happened around drinks. And as someone who didn't drink, and especially as a junior person, I, there was a lot of social friction I experienced as a non-drinker trying to figure out how to feel really included, um, but also not compromise my personal choices or bring a lot of attention to the fact that I don't drink. Um, and so this got me thinking that there must be a lot of or at least some other people who uh, feel similarly. And it turns out that a lot more people, um, a lot of people don't drink, but it's not, it's unfortunately not reflected on um, bar and restaurant menus. So um, I kind of like to think of this um, interest in this product in a couple of categories. So there are religious non-drinkers, people who follow halal or Mormon diets um, because you were not, allowed the alcohol isn't compliant with those diets. And if you're pregnant, vast majority of pregnant people do scale back um, alcohol consumption during pregnancy. Um, and, but there's also this really big and interesting group of people who are considered sober curious or millennial focused. So, um, and this trend of actively con reducing your consumption of alcohol is part of a larger wellness focused trend. So. First it was carbs, sugar, gluten, dairy, and grain, and now it's alcohol. Um, and to the extent that this past January, about a third of U.S. adults participated in dry January, which is a month-long challenge to yourself to kind of reduce or completely abstain from alcohol. And I think that just goes to show not only that this the market is right for a product like this, but also that there is kind of a need and a real push for a wellness-focused product in this way. Um, and to kind of back to kind of illustrate that, so the non-alcoholic wine and beer market are expected to grow eight percent annually in the U.S. and to and to be a thirty-six billion dollar business by twenty twenty-six. And I do think, uh, especially in the um, in the U.S., beer is a more mature industry, but that kind of makes a lot of like also gives a lot of room for young non-alcoholic wine companies like myself to kind of be. Um, make a name for ourselves and also as a testament to how people love wine but are more focused on wellness that for the first time since 1994 in 2020 annual wine sales actually dropped which is I thought really interesting so I I thought to myself I so when I got back to my experience about kind of what did I wish were there um, and I know wine as a wine as a beverage has a lot of social capital. And by that, I mean, people brag about how much they know about wine or t-shirts or memes. I think a lot of people connect to wine culture, but unfortunately, because of the alcohol content, it's incongruent with this wellness focused, sober curious movement. And also just blatantly um, excludes people who can't drink for, you know, other, 
you're pregnant or um, following an alcohol-free diet. So what I kind of came up with was launching a line of non-alcoholic wine. So our wine, so we launched with two wines, a red wine and a sparkling rosé, both made from Tempranillo grapes. They're sourced in Spain and dealcoholized in, in Germany. And they're some, I'm sure a lot of people don't know that, but some wines are actually finished with a fish product, which I thought was interesting. Um, and our wines are halal certified, which is interesting because it's a testament to how truly non-alcoholic they are because um, uh, alcohol isn't allowed in the halal diet. And a lot of other non-alcoholic beverages, wines on the market are simply less than 0.5% versus certified to be 0.0% ABV. I think it's also um, a key selling point for us as well. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people are wondering how this actually works. So we first create wine by fermenting grapes and go through all the steps to create a complex wine. And then you do repetitive distillation processes to remove the alcohol from the wine. But, and it has a complete flavor profile and complexity of the original wine, but just has, um, just without the alcohol, some people would like to avoid. And to kind of, um, so I knew that I was really excited that a product like this could exist, um, but to really get a sense of what other motivations beyond my personal one um, could exist. I when in 2018, when I really started working on this project, I, um, I, particip I interviewed hundreds of people through different tasting events. So I'd go to bridal pop-ups, cultural showcases, give people little uh, shot glasses of the wine to get a sense of one, is this a beverage that they feel they're really missing? And two, how it tastes. And beyond that, it's a really um, important focus of mine to get customer feedback. So a discount code for people who are interested in completing a survey post-purchase. And I have over 300 responses from that. So I have a really, I really have my ear to the ground of this space. Um, and so beyond my personal reason of just not wanting to be buzzed, I've, these are the kind of, these are some of the reasons that people often cite as why they, as to why they are interested in this product. Um, number one, a lot of people drink, but currently couldn't because of the alcohol content. Um, we're really excited to find this product. And a key selling point is the fact that ours are 0.0% alcohol and, um, and that makes them available to people who are who are pregnant or um, I think the key added and, and I think what really differentiates my product from others on the market is that we pride ourselves on not adding uh, juice to any of our products. A lot of the non-alcoholic aperitifs or non-alcoholic wines have up to 35% grape juice um, in their wine. And, um, makes the beverage seem a lot special and not really to be as um, socially equivalent to the wines that you would drink at a bar or restaurant or at a party. And lastly, you could also just be interested in our product because of the low calories. So because alcohol has seven grams, seven wines actually have 70% fewer calories than an alcoholic wine. So to date, um, so he's launched in July 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic, which which definitely caused some challenges. And to date, we've experienced a 200% growth rate in our monthly revenue. And now we're in, um, in revenue, and this is completely bootstrapped. And we're able to do that because of how how attractive our margin profile is. Um, so on a cash flow basis, we essentially break even because it's important to fund that inventory, but on a pure operating margin basis, including cost of acquisition, cost to deliver a heavy fragile product, our overall operating margin is 30%. And um, lastly, my goal for this product is to be everywhere. So. I, when I think of the, my goal for this company, I think of decaffeinated coffee and how at a certain point in time, to a coffee shop, everything had caffeine. And, but now you can, you can hardly go to a coffee shop and not have a decaffeinated option. So I think it's, um, that's kind of 
what I think dealcoholized wine should be. Wherever wine is sold, there should be a dealcoholized wine. And initiative, I'm currently onboarding with Pod Foods, which is a national distributor to especially retail stores. I'm um, launching soon in Brick and Click, which is a curated marketplace. Um, first location will be at the Oculus at the Royal Trade Center. And also I'm going to um, New York City based non-alcoholic wine and liquor store. Seeing that I was pregnant so many times, I'm so excited about your your products because I know how difficult it can be when you're in that setting and you would like to just hold something. I think you and Amy could create some sort of a bundle package. Uh, your, your target market is probably similar. I, I would love, and I apologize if you got into this, but I'd love to understand the process a little bit more. Are you working with the vineyards to create the wine and then de-alcoholize it? Or are you buying wine and then are you doing it? And are you managing that process yourself with your own equipment or is that outsourced? Sure, so there are kind of two key components to my um, supply chain. So first I find a complex bulk wine or I work with a winery to source an alcoholic wine. Um, and actually dealkalization technology is really, um, it's actually hard to preserve the underlying taste in that process. So I separately found a dealkoholizer who would then dealkoholize and um, bottle my wine, and it's and the non-alcoholic wine space is um, a bit more advanced in Europe, so that's why I do both source and dealkoholize in Europe. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, do you want to go, Greg? <laughs> Um, yeah, and I love the brand. It is such a good idea. And um, what I wanted to ask in terms of the, the inventory and as you are scaling, like how quickly can you purchase inventory and, and what does that turnaround time look like? Sure. So, um, so the a typical turnaround cycle would be six weeks, but um, I actually sold out within the, my first production run was um, 1000 bottles and I sold out um, within the first month of selling. And because it was COVID, all the ports were shut down and actually took me um, almost 12 weeks to get back into um, stock. But that was kind of one an anomaly because of a global pandemic, but that's definitely something that I am hyper aware of. Um, and that's why almost as soon as I can, I purchase new inventory because being out of stock is definitely not a good thing. <laughs> Hey, Tolu, great presentation. I know um, you alluded to some points of difference, but I was curious. I know Free is a pretty big player in the non-alcoholic wine space. I was curious, relative to them, as they're kind of the predominant player, are they in that, really, they're up at 0 0.5 or a higher percentage camp, or what's the point of difference, do you think, of your product versus Free? So Free is, I, I believe Free is categorized as a less than 0.5%, so it is FDA definition of non-alcoholic, but I think it does make a big difference to consumers, especially if you are a religious non-drinker or pregnant, I think it does make a massive difference. But separately, I would say um, that my product is different to free in many ways, not only because I am a digitally native brand, um, also they have, I think their red wine has 30% juice. And I think while it definitely makes it taste great, I'm sure, I just think it provides a much different um, experience for the customer. Great, thanks. Yeah, Tolu, I'd love to hear a little bit about the price point and how you think about the competitive set. I do think, um, you know, you mentioned a lot of other uh, non-alcoholic, you know, up and coming growing brands are similar in price point, but I, I also think, you know, uh, you can get a very nice bottle of, of wine for $40. Um, so I'm just curious um, how you think about that. Um, is that kind of where you plan to play? How do you think about like the product portfolio over time, potentially? Um, I think the sort of consumer competitive set here, of like, am I comparing this to an alcohol occasion, but I'm scaling back or a non-alcoholic occasion um, can really make a, a difference there in terms of where your product slots in on the price side. Sure. So this is a question I ask myself on a weekly basis, because even though my product is priced, I wish I could show you guys that I made a really nice slide about this. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so my product is priced in line with this set of digitally native elevated non-alcoholic options like Gia um, and others kind of playing in that space. But as I think of my goal to be omni-channel, I think there definitely is room to have lower priced wines in, um, in my portfolio down the line. 
Um, but I do think that I, I do think that the price point in a way also does kind of help consumer perception of it because I think um, the number one like troll Instagram troll comment I got was, oh, is this just grape juice? And I think the price in addition to the branding and the consumer education kind of helps drive home the point that this is an actual wine. It's it's real wine. <laughs> This is wonderful. Um, so thank you so much, Tolu. I really, really wonderful, wonderful brand. And, and I'm gonna, um, you can go ahead, we're gonna deliberate. Um, and, and I'm just gonna bring on um, our CRO from Founder Made, uh, Michelle Fenizio. Um, so Tolu, you can turn off your, your, your video. Okay. Um, and then, hi, Michelle. So, so I, 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 was, I was saying, listen, this is an incredible pitch challenge. We're doing so many pitch challenges. Um, but I would love to just tie, kind of just while the judges are deliberating and, and thinking about, you know, who's pitched just Michelle, I'd love for you to tell us like a little bit about, you know, some of the sponsors, the, the ch upcoming challenges that are happening, um, you know, the, the finalists and the prizes. Gosh, oh, so much to cover, so much to cover. So there's, I mean, one, one incredible day. Let's just start there. Sponsor wise, I, it was so fantastic to hear from Gorgeous who's been part of so many shows with us, Clearco. Oh, and also obviously, I mean, any, for anyone who didn't check them out after the session today, they're, they are listed on our site, Nutrifresh. I mean, and then, you know, speaking of them, right? Today is all, really all about brand building. It's about education. It's about building new relationships and building new partnerships with people who are going to help build your brand. So, for those of you who haven't engaged in the chat yet, or who haven't found somebody and and taken the time to reach out yet, DM them. Today we talked about DMing, you know, directly. And I, you know, I'm trying to think of which session that was, but it was a note that I had really written down because that's something that we've taken into how we've uh, built brands. But take that time to do that. It, it's so much fun realizing that you literally can get a hold of nearly anyone, and that one person can really, you know, change the game for your brand. And and speaking of, I mean, Estee Lauder. Sarah Michelle Geller. These are all connections that we made through Instagram DMs. So if that's any indicator, that's really fun. And you know, Megan mentioned about the pitch competitions. We have a, a number of upcoming shows. The pitch competition is a really fun part of our ecosystem. It's literally how we started. Uh, we how we started Founder Made is off pitch competition. So if if you're building something, please submit to our next upcoming pitch competition in November. Uh, that being said, I see a bunch of faces popping up. So it seems like the judges are maybe back from deliberation. Is that true? Yes. And we can bring everybody back for um, our finalists as well. Um, so if we can just bring everyone back. And I, it was like a very difficult. There were a lot of in between, between, you know, the, the, the sapien, I mean, Uva, you know, uh, sacred, I, I just love the whole thing, sacred serve. I mean, we really, so, so who wants to announce? I feel like Jennifer, Kat, Kath, Greg, who wants to announce, Katie, who would like to announce the, the winner in the fight out of the three finalists? I think we'd all say it one, like one, two, three, right? I, mean, this is I think that's the way no, to do I'm, it. Right? I'm, I'm this happy, is, this happy, is like the Zoom I'm one, two, three, happy. where, you know, it's, it's a little, it's always a little exciting on the, on the Zoom. So, um, ready? You should one. go for it. It'll be hard for us to coordinate. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, right? We'll do drum roll, please. So um, they were all very good. Um, it was a very hard decision. Um, we did deliberate a little bit. Um, I think the, the winner for us is Sacred Serve. I think we thought it had a very clean pitch, a really strong product offering with, with good traction in market. Loved the recyclable packaging. I think that's kind of an incredible breakthrough innovation for sure. Um, but know that um, Sapiens and Uva, those were also great, great pitches, great products, and it was, it was a really hard choice. And the wow. finals. Oh, go ahead. The oh, finals. No, 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 what were you going to say, Michelle? I was going to say, that's so exciting. I, I loved hearing about everyone's brand. And so, but Sacred Serve, I'm so happy and congratulations. And and the winner gets the golden ticket for a, a spot for the next Entrepreneur Ele Elevator Pitch, a dedicated feature on entrepreneur.com, 30 minutes of a one-on-one -on -one call with Michelle Romano, who's the founder of ClearCo and judge on Dragon's Den, an in-depth review by ClearCo, 
um, 20% off of the six months of the pilot core, uh, one hour of executive office hours with the founder of pilot, which is amazing because he's built a massive, massive business and platform, one hour and one on one consultation with Gerber executives, $5,000 disc $5, discount off of capital advance and, and Gerber, Gerber finance and a feature on Gerber's finance podcast, we grow together and so much more. So look out for that. Finalists, you also get a, a great package that we'll be following up with. Um, but thank you. We, we, love, we love building brands at FounderMade and we're here to support you as you guys go from, you know, I, I, one of our brands actually that, that was speaking on one of the panels this, this week, or sorry, today, this week, um, she said that she went, she came to our first show and now after three, or three years has a nine figure business. And she could, she could, she could barely afford to, you know, join our show, you know, three years ago. So just know the sky's the limit. And especially in consumer products, you can scale rapidly and we're here to support you. So thanks so much. Thank you, judges. You guys are part of our heart, our mission.